All right, so I think we'll just... Are you okay if we just go over this one video? Yeah, yeah. Today we talk about the fall of Ubisoft. Look, I don't like to hold my tongue. I like to speak my mind. And from my perspective, when I see a company that has failed to deliver quality to their customers, that have completely ignored any criticism, whether that's from the industry itself, from critics, or their fans, they get what they deserve. And in the case of Ubisoft, this is a victory for consumers. This is exactly what we want to see, because if you're not working for us, you're working against us, and that's what they've been doing for years. So when you're a company that's as recognized as Ubisoft, one of the most recognizable names in all of gaming, they're a cornerstone of AAA, you're going to have some ups and downs. But over the last few years, they've had a lot of downs. They've been digging a grave that I don't think that they can escape. I didn't realize kind of going into this how downward of a trend they were. And like overall for like the past, like what, like five years? Yeah, well, you have to think Ubisoft is one of the major players in the in the in the like 2000s right like they launched the ta they mainstreamed the tactical shooter genre was rainbow six and with like uh ghost recon like they made the tactical they like really popularized and basically made the tactical genre mainstream yeah okay i mean with their their tom clancy franchise like you know that's that's where they made their bread and butter. And Splinter Cell was like the the one franchise that would rival uh, Metal Gear Solid when it came to stealth. Yeah, true. Okay, thinking about it, yeah. See, like my whole my whole venture into Ubisoft games, probably the only real ones that I can think of, is um, the Assassin's Asked Creed. Creed. Yeah. Assassin's Creed. Yeah. So, I I've I've played that since like what was it? the third one or something like that whatever was revolutionary war yeah that would have been assassin's creed 3 because i started uh i really got into the franchise with two okay. like i played the first one it was just the first one was okay there were some issues with it but I, I liked altair as a protagonist but then the second one is when they added um Ezio. yep and that's when it really blew up because that's when Ezio got like a whole he got his own trilogy Yes. Yeah. You know, and actually, I I won't lie. Um, Assassin's Creed Brotherhood had really fun multiplayer. Really? See, I've yeah, never. It, it, that's my thing. Why I've liked the Assassin's Creed is it's one of those games that I enjoyed soloing. I don't think I've ever yeah. multiplayered any of them. So, there was a mode where you were filled in a map, and there were a bunch of NPCs, and you were disguised as an NPC. And your goal was that you had to find and track your assassination target while one was tracking you. So kind of like prop hunt. In a way, yeah, in a way. It was really cool. So, like, say, like, there was a, uh, uh, the map would be like a carnival, and you, I would be dressed as, like, a purple Harlequin, right? And there would be tons of... Harlequins so on the, the map and tons of read the title. other people on the map. And uh, basically the goal is to sneak through and, and try to blend in with the NPCs while hunting your target. And it was so fun. And it, they never did it again. Yeah. <laughs> it was like you, 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 were, you were right there. You were right fucking there. <laughs> Just like, all you had to do was support it. Like, Interest, controversy. Now their own investors are calling for their leadership to be ousted and for the company to be sold. How do you get yourself to that point? That's what I want to answer today. There's a lot of other companies that are traveling this road to ruin, and I want this to be a lesson to all. So let's talk about the rise and fall of Ubisoft. As of recording this video, Ubisoft stock just hit a low that they haven't seen in over a decade. Their stock prices fell almost 84% over the past few years, and with recent releases like Skull and Bones, Assassin's Creed Mirage, X Defiant, Prince of Persia, The Lost Crown, Star Wars, Outlaws, and the upcoming Assassin's Creed Black Shadows, nothing seems to be able to pull them out of this death spiral, and no matter how many games they release in quick succession. When a company releases six games over the course of a couple of years, that's usually the sign of success, but in the case of Ubisoft, each release seems to be taking them one step closer towards the brink of collapse. So how did this happen? Why did, did this he, happen? How does a oh, did he mention the Avatar game? No. No. Yeah, he even forgot that, and that came out like a year or two ago. Yeah, the game. That's how forgettable Ubisoft games are, because that was made by the same studio that does the Division Two. Uh, I forget what studio it's called, but like I think it's Massively or something. Okay. Like they did, they made an open world um Avatar game, that was based off of the movie. Uh, it's like a offshoot of the second Avatar film. Okay. So it's like, you know, more blue people and shooting shit with bows and stuff like that. But like, yeah, no, it's the, the, the forgettable that he didn't even list it. 
<laughs> like, I think he mentioned this game to me, and I was like, yeah, I had no idea about this. <laughs> yeah, you, you even forgot about it. We talked about it like earlier. Like, <laughs> first stone of the AAA industry fall this far from grace. Well, to answer that, we need to go back and look to where Ubisoft came from, where it peaked, and where it fell. Ubisoft, like many developers, cut their teeth on PC games in the late 80s. A game company initially started by the five Guillemont brothers, who still own and operate the company today, initially focused on games distribution as they slowly moved into games development. Titles like Zombie, Prince of Persia, and a few others helped them to gain a foothold, but it wasn't until 1995 that the company would make a name for itself. Rayman exploded onto the scene, a game using interactive and creative puzzle and platforming mechanics that we hadn't even seen before that sold over 400,000 units by the end of the year, becoming the most popular game in Europe and cementing itself in gaming history. Following their success came rapid expansion. By the year 2000, Ubisoft saw exponential growth on their publishing side with major victories on the Dreamcast, with titles like Grandia 2, my favorite JRPG of all time, Tokyo Extreme Racer, F1 Racing Championship, and Taxi 2. However, it was on the PlayStation 2 that Ubisoft would find its identity. While they were still publishing great games like FromSoft's Armored Core 2 and Eternal Ring and Snowblind Studios' Champions of Dorath, it was during this time that Ubisoft acquired the license to use Tom Clancy's stories and name in a series of games with Tom Clancy's Ghost Recon and later Splinter Cell taking the stage. After this, Ubisoft went on a blitz with original titles, quickly rolling out sequel after sequel. Splinter Cell kicked it off in 2003 with Pandora Tomorrow in 2004, Chaos Theory in 2005, Double Agent in 2006. Ghost Recon launched in 2002. It had a sequel in 2004, a next version of it with Advanced Warfighter in 2006, Advanced Warfighter 2 in 2007, Prince of Persia, The Sands of Time came out in 2003, and yep, just like the others, it saw rapid follow-ups with Warrior Within in 2004 and Two Thrones in 2005. Around the mid-2000s, Ubisoft must have realized that this rapid pace was not sustainable, and it started to affect the quality of their games. Later releases took longer. The next Prince of Persia game didn't appear until 2008, and it took four years to develop the next Far Cry game from the original that came out in 2004. Despite this intense schedule, Ubisoft was holding its own against rivals in Activision with its military shooters and competing against Konami's Metal Gear Solid through Splinter Cell. Regardless of their success in publishing, developing licensed IPs, and military shooters, it was the release of Assassin's Creed in 2007 that sent Ubisoft into orbit, and it bridged a gap with a title that appealed to audiences worldwide. There was nothing like it in the market at the time. This game was an enigma. It was far and away the best-looking game on consoles. Its fluid movement, parkour, and combat felt alien. Its setting of reliving our ancestors' memories while we chase a relic to try to stop the shadow government Templars was fresh and original. Assassin's Creed defined modern gaming at the time, and it made Ubisoft a household name. Yeah, so, like, even honestly going through all those titles for the history of it, like... I honestly don't think I played a single Ubisoft game until Assassin's Creed 3. See, that's I, just a shame, because as somebody that likes shooters and stuff, you would have really liked doing Terrorist Hunt on uh, Vegas 2. Because that was some of my best memories growing up, is uh, Rainbow Six New Vegas 2. Just throwing it on the hardest difficulty, and just breaching, banging a room, and trying to, like kill some terrorists that like had fucking laser aim yeah. like, <laughs> like it was so hard but it was so fulfilling like See, it was like, just a simple idea i probably like, would have enjoyed that honestly yeah now they're being fully sustained by like pretty much siege rainbow six siege is what keeps them going because even Jeez. assassin's creed isn't so good because like i tried playing valhalla and everybody was all fucking like excited for it i thought it kind of sucked like it, it felt too floaty for something somebody that's supposed to be a hulking viking i'm dashing around and jumping with like double-handed axes and shit i'm like yeah this, yeah this it isn't... doesn't have the same weight mechanic feel and all yeah, that kind yeah, of stuff it, it feels too fucking floaty and that's the problem with ubisoft games is like they've all become the same thing like i could put in front of you a far cry game and there's a good chance you wouldn't know if it was Far Cry 3, 4, 5, or 6. Jesus. Like, because it's all so the there's same no shit. Diversity in the gaming that much? Jeez. No, no. They, they've, they've literally went from making innovative games like uh, tactical shooters like uh, Rainbow Six and Ghost Recon and, like, you know, in, with good platformers like Rayman and stuff, into creating these soulless, open-world, copy-paste, icon-chasing fests. Like, basically, like, imagine, like, you've played Assassin's Creed 3. Picture that, but, like, double in size, and then a cash shop to sell XP boosters, or then just... <laughs> copy and paste it with different things oh blue people for the avatar game oh this random chick for the star wars game like oh god that's fucking awful yeah they became a copy paste studio and that's that's why they're in this state because the only the, the one game that they're doing well with 
is a competitive shooter with Siege. It's the one fucking game that isn't like everything in their portfolio. And that's the one that's doing well. And they haven't realized that. <laughs> Ubisoft was everywhere at this time. You'd be hard pressed not to turn on your console or turn on your PC and see that logo pop up. And it wasn't just the games that they were making, it was the games that they were publishing. They had such a good eye for talent, such a good eye for great games. And as a result, they made a ton of money. I mean, they published Morrowind. I didn't even know that. I was going through some of the history of all the different games that they had published over the years, and I was sitting back going like, man, these guys are raking in cash at the time. But it wasn't just those games as well. It was also the successes that they were seeing with the games that they were making. They had such a fresh and high quality outlook on all the games that they were creating. They were really leaning into presentation more than anything else. They wanted to make sure that their games just looked the best, hands down, bar none, no competition. And they pulled it off. Advanced Warfighter 1 and 2 are some of my favorite shooters of all time, even kind of more than some of the Call of Duty games at the time. They're likely the games that ended up inspiring Call of Duty Modern Warfare 1 and 2. If you look at Splinter Cell and Metal Gear Solid, they leaned really hard into the stealth aspects, the spy aspects of those kind of games. And as a result, they found their own following and gave a really unique experience that you weren't getting from the Metal Gear Solid games. While the narrative wasn't nearly as strong, it was still pretty good, but the gameplay was completely different. Then you bring out Assassin's well, yeah, Creed. Yeah, not to mention, um, Splinter Cell actually was the game that really revolutionized shadowing. Okay. Because that was the first game that you could actually um, shoot out the light bulbs, and that would make rooms darker, so you could literally shoot out the lights, and then the goggles on your back, when they would glow, that means that you were in stealth with the shadows so it would sort of help do that that was the first game that used dynamic lighting like that oh wow for stealth yeah that's where ubisoft was and now look at them jesus christ every you time see, what it, see how they've fallen they went from innovating a, the stealth genre with dynamic shadowing down to copy paste marker chasing because it's safe they went too safe well, that's the thing, like, when I when I talk about, like, Assassin's Creed and the stuff that I like, like, I genuinely liked it because it was a stealth game and, like, it challenged you to play completely different because there was a repercussion for run-and-gun style playing. Like, typically, it got you killed. Yeah, well, that's the thing. That's the funny thing, too, is, like, if you play, like, you know, the new Assassin's Creed? Yeah. Not Mirage, but the ones before that, like, the um, the ones after Syndicate... But before Mirage, the um, Odyssey, Valhalla, and... Um, Origin? What was that? Origin, yeah. They were all RPGs. Yeah. Open world RPGs. Where it's like you could do stealth and sneak up on somebody, and you would just get like, oh, a little crit bonus. And yeah. that's cool in an RPG, but like my Assassin's Creed shouldn't be a Skyrim. Yeah. But, and, but that's like... Okay, and then you have Far Cry, which is that with guns. And then you have <laughs> Ghost Recon, which is Far Cry, but you're a professional soldier instead of a random guy. Jesus Christ, the diversity here sounds like it sucks. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, yeah, no, no. The only reason the way you the only way you could tell the difference between like Far Cry and like it would be like a little bit of the art style maybe isn't as gritty as Ghost Recon, and in Ghost Recon you could go third person. But if I were to, you were to put first person, if I were to pull up Breakpoint, Wildlands, and two of the Far Cries, and say which two of these are Far Cry and which two of these are um, Ghost Recons, you would have to like sit there for a while and, and like look at like oh well this one's a little brighter so i think this one might be a far cry holy shit uh, apparently yeah. i made a genuinely good call by not playing any assassin's creed after unity so far mm -hmm. <laughs> so i played like mm -hmm. three to what is it unity was like the last one right that came after syndicate and brotherhood and all that uh uh no um it was Unity was that was the French Revolution one, right? I think so, yes. That one was the right before um Syndicate. Okay. So Syndicate would have so, been the last one cuz that's, that's the last of the classic Assassin's Creed. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I just I just inherently made a good choice by not doing anything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, no, no. You're you're like yeah i'm not gonna play this is probably good yeah and, and don't get me wrong the, well because i didn't like how the store how it felt like the game was changing and i was like no this kind of feels like it's different it, and it was it's definitely different from like how earlier games to me played yeah 
Oh, definitely. Like, if you play, like, um, like Unity or Syndicate compared to, like, um, any of the Ezio trilogy or three or Black Flag. Yes. Like, you could, you could definitely feel the, the design shift. Like, it's almost like a parabolic curve, right? Yep. But, like, it, it, I mean, and the sad thing is the assassin, like, the actual, like, quote unquote, new age assassin's creed, like, origins and stuff. The story isn't that bad. No. But it's just schlock. It's it's like the same. It's Ubi schlock is what we call it. <laughs> because it's the same open world thing. And it's like, okay, well, uh, I can't do this base because you need level 18 and I'm gear level 17. So I need to go and, and go and get a better bow. Yes. Because I don't have the attack power yeah. for this. And it's like, or I could go to the store and buy a gear crate. Oh, my single player game. Yep. Yeah. Uh, I, I noticed how like, like some of that stuff was going with like syndicate and all that. And like, you couldn't attack this because you weren't a high enough level. Yeah. And I was like, okay, well I'll just go back to core mechanics on the game. And I went around and I would stealth kill everybody. And I could take out an area that was like a couple levels above me. Yeah, now imagine they take that out of you because they made it in an RPG where your raw numbers matter. Oh my god, that was fucking frustrating. I probably wouldn't even yeah. play enough of the game to care. Yeah, and th and that's the problem. Like even even looking through the story, it's one of those things where a good story or, or a good gameplay can get you through a bad story. Yes. Assassin's Creed is the proof that the inverse, as much as I wish it would, does not work. That a a good story can't get you through Cannot bad carry. gameplay yeah like like there has to be like like that has to be like a kojima level story like to get you through the the gameplay it did and it was just okay that's awful a completely different level at this point with ubisoft if you're buying one of their games nine times out of ten you're gonna have your socks knocked off they were incredible experiences and ubisoft knew that they capitalized on it and they profited Following the release of Assassin's Creed in 2007, Ubisoft entered into a golden era that solidified their place as one of the leaders in the AAA industry. The success of Assassin's Creed was not just a one-off hit. It became a flagship franchise that grew in scope and ambition with each installment. Assassin's Creed 2 in 2009 expanded upon the original's foundations with deeper gameplay mechanics and more engaging narrative and a charismatic protagonist in Ezio Auditore, still the best protagonist in all of Assassin's Creed. The game was a commercial and critical success, selling over 9 million copies and becoming one of the most celebrated entries in the entire series. The success continued with Assassin's Creed Brotherhood in 2010 and Assassin's Creed Revelations in 2011. In combination with this, Ubisoft was experiencing major successes with their Far Cry series. Far Cry 3 in 2012 was a groundbreaking title that redefined open-world gaming. It introduced vast, explorable islands filled with diverse environments and a gripping story and one of the most memorable protagonists in all of gaming history. And I think that character shows just how far Ubisoft today has fallen from where they came from. No shot Ubisoft ever makes a villain like this again. Sorry, what did you say? What did you say? Mm -hmm. Do you want me to slice you open like I did your friend? Shut the fuck up! Okay? I'm the one with the fucking dick. Look at me. Look me in the fucking eye. Hey! You fuck! Look me in the eye! You're my bitch. I rule this fucking kingdom. Far Cry 3 sold over 10 million copies and was lauded as one of the best games of the generation, setting a new benchmark for open-world shooters. The series continued to thrive with Far Cry 4 in 2014 and Far Cry 5 in 2018, each expanding on the franchise's formula with new mechanics and narratives. By 2018, Far Cry 5 became the fastest-selling title in Ubisoft's history, moving over 5 million copies within the first week, solidifying the franchise's place in history. In parallel with the success that they had going on with the Far Cry series, Tom Clancy's Rainbow Six Siege initially launched to a modest reception, but through consistent updates and community engagement, it has now grown into one of the most popular and enduring multiplayer shooters, even still today. By 2018, Rainbow Six Siege had amassed over 30... Yeah, I'm gonna be honest. Like, I thought that Rainbow Six Siege was dead, like, years ago. It was, but it came back. Really? Yeah, no, it was one of those things where the competitive scene took a real big hit, and, like, not a lot of people were engaged with it, but they did a mass rebalancing, and because of that, and Jinxy, because he was making, like, fun videos, people started playing it again, and then word of mouth got out, and it actually blew back up like really it, yes like they actually did claw back they pulled off like a mini final fantasy 14 no man's sky like where they brought it back and it is now starting to decline again Jesus. <laughs> like, well, i can imagine like, why but you know holy shit yeah yeah no it's sad and it's like i like uh they were talking about Assassin's Creed, and I so wanted to slide in, but I'm waiting to talk about Skull and Bones. <laughs> mm. 
does that does that have a little sore spot with you? Yeah, kinda. Like, cause okay. it's it's one of those it's one of those things where it's like when you like something and then it becomes something you completely opposite. Okay. And it's just like you can see the stupidity from a mile away, and they're like chugging along with it. Wasn't that the uh, like, the quadruple A rated game? Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> okay. The one that they had to release because they took money from the Singaporean government. Yes. Like yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, players. yeah. yeah. Tom Clancy's The Division in 2016 was another major hit, offering a compelling blend of third-person shooting and RPG mechanics set in a post-apocalyptic New York. It was Ubisoft's fastest-selling new IP at launch, earning $330 million in sales within the first week. It showcased Ubisoft's ability to successfully launch a new IP while still being able to maintain their existing franchises. If we take a snapshot of the successes from 2000 to 2018, we see a Ubisoft that was consistently delivering on high-quality experiences while innovating within existing franchises, creating new franchises, doing all kinds of things. But at the exact same time, we also see a foreboding trend. The minute that they see a game become successful, they hammer that nail again and again and again, sometimes within such quick succession that we're seeing sequels with games within year to year to year to year, back to back to back to back, and then they stop. And that's going to take a toll, not only on the developers, but also on the audiences. But by 2018, Ubisoft was worth $24 a share. It's the highest price. It's still the highest price that they've ever been worth. And in that, that's the perfect reflection, whether you care about share prices or not, it's the perfect reflection of what the company was worth at the time. Ten times the value that they were before they released Assassin's Creed. They were swimming in cash. You know, I think there's something to be said about all of this, too. Just from, like, I, I would consider myself, like, a, a very casual gamer at the best. A perspective in that, like, you look at this, and, like, they, they rapid-fired and beat the shit out of this. Meanwhile, you have stuff like GTA. And over that entire same period of time, they've released five games. Yeah. And, yeah, and, that, and, and that's, that's it. That's the thing. That's the thing, right? Like, Rockstar, they they have success, and Rockstar would slow their development down and make quality. And, and that's one of those things where it's like, Ubisoft is a victim of their own success. Because they found success, and then they're like, we want more of that. So they just kept going and leaning into it, and it burnt out. Like, yeah, no, I could totally see that. I meant to only understand that. They were so successful. They were massive. But when you reach those peaks, there tends to be a trend that follows. And they've been following that trend straight into the ground. As Ubisoft entered into 2018, the cracks in its previously successful formula began to show. While the company had relied on its major franchises to drive growth and maintain its position within the industry, the strategy began to falter. The initial decline of this period can largely be attributed to Ubisoft's over-reliance on its established franchises, a pattern that we've seen with many major publishers. The once groundbreaking mechanics and narratives that defined Ubisoft's titles were beginning to feel repetitive, leading to players feeling bored and fatigued with Ubisoft's design. I'll be honest, by the third Assassin's Creed, I had already tapped out because I felt like I saw the writing on the wall. Every time I watched any of the reveals or trailers, I said, yeah, I've done all this before. This over-reliance on existing franchises resulted in a slew of releases that, while still commercially viable, lacked the innovative spark that once defined the company. Assassin's Creed Odyssey in 2018 was a prime example of this issue. Despite it being a commercial success and receiving positive reviews, it didn't quite reach the heights of previous entries in the series. While it expanded upon RPG elements that were introduced... I'll honestly say, yeah, I did actually play this, now that I think back to it. Like, but it was just that so unenjoyable for me that, like, I just didn't even continue to play it. Like, everything yeah, felt awful compared to, that's like... The problem with modern Ubisoft games. <laughs> but yeah just like I, I there was no enjoyability it didn't feel like the same like thing like you know you're talking about like god what this would have been like the seventh or eighth installment in the fucking series like you you to totally have it be so drastically different and like me technically being like target audience like I've enjoyed the fucking series so far it's just I'm a very sporadic player. I should be able to pick up the game and actually do fairly well. And felt like I'm learning, like, the first game in a series. Yeah, and that's essentially what it was. It was like a reboot, right? Like, And that's why a lot of Assassin's Creed fell off. Because, like, I don't want an open-world RPG. I I have other games for that. Yeah. I play MMOs. They're... My... Like, Guild Wars 2... Black Desert Online, Final Fantasy XIV will always be a better open world RPG than you will be. Yes. Assassin's Creed. Yeah. Like, that's just how it's going to be. You need to be what you were, what you're good at. Yeah. And now that I think about it, yeah, there are things with, like, this game that I remember, like, vividly. Like, there are per certain areas where, like, when you're playing, it was, like, people were so overpowered until you got that right thing. 
Yeah, and it it was really enjoyable because it it took the the wind out of your sails of your journey. It yeah. literally made you follow. It's an open world RPG, but it was designed in such a way that you had to play it literally. Yeah, and it was like it's it it, it well, just it, didn't feel good to play. Like on that, I can remember one thing specifically. Like there was a guy, okay. And this was just at a sheer, like, strategy play, like, RPG-style playing, that, like, I ended up going into a wrong area at a wrong time, wasn't up to that level yet, didn't know because the game direction is awful, um, and he's, like, one of the mini-bosses for the level, right? Like, ten steps into the wrong fucking area, and I encounter this mini-boss who pursued me for, like, a third of the map. And I would have to, like, engage and back off. Engage and back off. And I had lured him, like, literally over half the way that I had already traveled before I was able to defeat him. But then, like, because I had defeated him ahead of time, now I'm overpowered for everything else that I had to do. Yeah. But you're still not powerful enough, then, to go and finish up that part. Yes. Yes. So you like you're like in this uncomfortable middle ground. Yeah, you're in this weird like, limbo state, and nothing's enjoyable. <laughs> yeah. Well, and it and it's and it's funny too because it's like it doesn't even have that benefit of like an MMO, right? Yeah. Like in EverQuest, when we would accidentally fuck up and overpool, and you know you were dying and looking at hours of your experience being lost, you would scream and voice in like general chat, right? Yeah. And like people would show up. And they would help you. And that was compelling. But it, stuff like that being chased by like an uber elite mob in a single player game isn't really all that fun. Yeah. yeah. It, it's more fun in MMOs where you're taking it down together. But there's... It, well, and especially it, for me it wasn't that fun because like I'm such a casual gamer that I know if I don't do this now... That the next time I pick this up, I'm immediately in a boss fight still. So it's yeah. not even like I'm at a point where I can stop or back out of. Yeah, you, you got to lean into it. Like, yeah. So now it's it's how much longer and how much more time that I'm invested in this game doing all this stuff that I don't even want to fucking do in the first place. That was a complete accident. In Assassin's Creed Origins, the players and critics alike felt that the formula was becoming stale, with the vast majority of the open world and numerous side activities feeling more like a checklist rather than an engaging experience. This propagated a shared perception between players and critics of more of the same. Ubisoft games were becoming predictable, drawn out, and boring. Far Cry New Dawn in 2019 suffered from the exact same issues. As a direct sequel to Far Cry 5, it attempted to build on the narrative and setting, but was seen as more of an expansion than a full-fledged new installment. The game was a commercial success to a degree, but it didn't match the sales or the impact of Far Cry 3 or Far Cry 4. The narrative was considered weaker, the post-apocalyptic setting, while a new direction for the series didn't really resonate strongly with the player base, this underwhelming reception was indicative of a larger issue, the lack of fresh ideas and a growing formulaic approach to game design. Another notable release during this period was The Division 2 in 2019. Now, this game was well-received. It had refined mechanics over the first game, the end-game content was really engaging, and it was twice the size, if not larger, than the first game. However, despite its reception, it didn't meet Ubisoft's high sales expectations. The live service model that they had injected into the game arbitrarily, while successful in Rainbow Six Siege, did not effectively translate into The Division 2. This is partly due to market saturation, as other players are more invested in other live service games, but from my perspective as a fan from Division 2, the live service model just didn't work here. It felt generic. In a game where you're finding loot, and that's the gameplay loop, the last thing that you want to do is buy things to wear. You want to stand out for your achievements in the game, not how much you spent on loot boxes. This pattern of diminishing returns, sense. poorly implemented monetization, and loss of connection with the players is a common issue for companies that heavily rely on their existing franchises. While sequels and spin-offs can capitalize on established fan bases, they also run the risk of alienating players by offering experiences that feel all too familiar, or injecting things into those experiences that make them, well, just something the players don't want to engage with whatsoever. Ubisoft's reliance on its core franchises like Assassin's Creed, Far Cry, and the Tom Clancy games led to a perception that the company was simply reusing the same templates with minor tweaks and adding monetization. This lack of innovation and growing similarities between their titles resulted... So obviously that's a shared sentiment across the board because if he's reiterating here, obviously you're not wrong with what you were stating. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, that, and that's like the issue with like Ubisoft, right? Is like you have these amazing franchises. Like they're finally doing Splinter Cell, a, a, a rebooted Splinter Cell. We've been asking for it for over a decade. Oof. Like they haven't released a Splinter Cell since Blacklist. They threw um, Sam Fisher into Rainbow Six Siege. As, like, as kind of like a, a band-aid to that, I'm guessing. In a way, but also to like sort of like keep it going, right? Like, like the story is literally like Sam Fisher 
gets pulled out of uh, third echelon to act as like the team trainer for Team Rainbow after the whole Night Haven incident because they wanted somebody good. And Sam Fisher was like, you know, near retirement age and stuff, so they pulled him out of third echelon so he could be like a trainer okay. in Siege. Like, so it's like you're doing lore. Yeah. For the game that we've been asking, asking for <laughs> for a decade that would print money. It's like when we had to fight with Square Enix over like Final Fantasy 7 remastered, like just re- make another Final Fantasy 7 and then they fucked that up by making it like big brain like <laughs> you know meta commentary on remakes and shit so it's like i'm hoping they don't try to pull something off like that yeah oh man resulted in players being less excited about their new games and they began to see ubisoft games as formulaic in design with sprawling open worlds filled with repetitive tasks rather than unique and engaging experiences and i think that's the most troubling thing when it comes to ubisoft it's their aversion to criticism get that away from me and they're they're not alone in that okay there's plenty of other studios and journalists that are out there that feel the same way don't listen to the gamers those angry gamers they don't know anything and look i get it well nine times out of ten players don't know how to voice their criticisms effectively oftentimes they're just being mean when they say things they're still telling you that something's wrong with your games and you need to fix it but year after year ubisoft has completely failed to listen to any criticism whether that's coming from professional critics or the players people have been saying for years how formulaic their design is how how scary predictable their games are i know that if i log into an open world ubisoft game it's just going to be a checklist simulator Everybody still remembers when their developers took to Twitter to <laughs> criticize Elden Ring of all games for its open world design, its quest design, and its UI. <laughs> How the fuck do you do that? That's the best game that we've had. One of the best games that we've had in the last decade. Yeah. Why would you look at a game like I know that? That's look at the success agreed upon across the board. Internalize some of the things yeah. that this game did well, why players liked it, and then reflect that in our games going forward. That's how you make better products. You learn from your competition. Learn from the games that do well. Instead of looking at it, wanting to criticize it, and trying to make excuses why you think that your games are better. Don't play Assassin's Creed instead. Fuck that. Look, Ubisoft had a bit of a resurgence in 2018 to 2019, and it looked like they were getting back on the horse. It looked like they were listening to player feedback, they were implementing in their games, it was making better games as a result, they were making a lot of money, but that only lasted for so long. After a period of declining interest and fatigue, Ubisoft managed to stage a bit of a resurgence in 2019 and 2020 by revisiting some of their core franchises with a renewed focus and experimenting with some fresh ideas. Now, who thought something like that could actually have a positive impact on your sales? One of the most significant releases during this time was Assassin's Creed Valhalla in 2020. This game was a commercial hit, selling more copies during its launch week than any other previous Assassin's Creed title. It received praise for its engaging narrative, improved combat mechanics, and rich historical setting. Valhalla revitalized interest in the series. It showed that Ubisoft could make changes. However, that isn't to say that players' complaints didn't remain the same. Many reviewers and... I actually never played this game because of how bad the, the other one was. The Roman one. Like genuinely because that game was oh. so bad and, and and with all the stuff that i had interest in like or incurred in that game and everything else and like there it felt like they were trying to be so many things like there's a fucking whole sailing thing that like you do pretty early on in the game and it's like oh well this will be your mode of travel from here on out for places and it's like you had to like learn a whole new mechanic and you've like already invested a fair amount of time at that point into the game yeah. and it's like well now this is going to be like the whole fucking thing from here on out yeah no, that was like the issue right like because like especially with the time period like it was like the it was like greece right so you, you didn't have much technology so like the reason black flag was fun was because it was boats in the age of piracy yes yeah that's fun because that's literally, you know, the time for naval combat. Yeah. It's like, you know, during the rise of the piracy and, and, and you know, that, right? But we, they didn't do that, you know? like. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, like, no, it, I, I, I think it's just fucking stupid, honestly. I, I, I just, the whole fucking fact of, like, I want to just play an enjoyable fucking game. Not sit there and play a game, think I'm figuring out how to play a game, like, circling into a groove and it's like oh well here's a whole new method inside the fucking game that now it's gonna be a key fucking thing because then from there on out it becomes like fucking naval battles and shit and like yeah. you have this whole other like thing happen and it's like why why where the fuck did this even come into the storyline why wasn't this earlier when like you're teaching me things and yeah. it's like now and... now i've got something where i'm like a total novice at and then something else where it's like, oh, no, I'm experienced enough to, like, handle myself okay here. Yeah, and it needs to fit the theme and the fun. Yes. It's it's yes. fun during Assassin's Creed 4. 
because the piracy is fun. But naval combat, when it's bows and arrows, are not fun. Like, yeah. Anyway, keep going. And players lamented over the length of the game, and while Valhalla introduced some innovative elements, territory arcs as well as the narrative just dragged on for far too long. The game's average completion time was over 60 hours, and 100% completion was nearing over 200 hours. No matter what you do, elements that were praised at the beginning of the game are going to start to feel repetitive, and it's just, yet again, going to feel like a checklist of tasks. In the same year, they released Watch Dog Legions, which attempted to innovate with its play-is-anyone mechanic, allowing the player to recruit and control virtually any character in the entire game world. While the game received mixed reception due to some technical issues and a less than compelling story than we've seen from its predecessors, it sold relatively well, and it showed that the company was willing to take some risks and explore some new concepts with existing franchises. Immortals Phoenix Rising in 2020 was another one of those key releases that showed Ubisoft had a willingness to experiment and even come out with some new IPs. The game offered a vibrant and humorous take on Greek mythology combined with open-world exploration and puzzle-solving and action combat. There were a lot of folks that liked this game, and in some cases, people liked it even more than Breath of the Wild at the time. Though it didn't reach the commercial heights of Assassin's Creed or Far Cry, it showed that Ubisoft could still deliver a fresh and enjoyable experience outside of their established franchises. However, I think the most important thing to keep in mind during this period of time and the surge of growth at Ubisoft, and the biggest boon to Ubisoft at the time as well as many other developers as well, is that well, there was a pandemic and lockdown that was driving an increase in game sales and player engagement. With people spending more time at home, demand for games surged. Ubisoft benefited from this greatly as their established franchises and live service games offered an extensive amount of content for players to explore. Rainbow Six Siege saw massive growth during this period, with the player base growing to over 70 million players by the end of 2021. Continued support through regular updates, new operators, and seasonal events helped keep that community engaged and invested, even today. Any game studio that had a game that came out or was ready to release right around the time of lockdowns saw massive growth and massive profits. Go figure. But as we've learned, that growth is inorganic and unsustainable, and none of them had been able to maintain it. So with that said, yeah, of course Ubisoft was going to see a little bit of growth there, and they definitely evolved a little bit past some of their game design issues, but the vast majority of those issues still remain. Those same criticisms were still there regardless of the years that had gone by. And one of the other problems that Ubisoft has is the minute that they see something work, they will hammer it until the wheels fall. Yeah, I just feel like this, this is just the same fucking thing. Like, they just keep doing the same thing over and over and over and over and over and expecting the new fucking results and all that. Yeah, or expecting the same results because they were good, but not realizing that they had lightning in a bottle. Yeah, yeah. Like, it's... you know, like, it, it's not fun. Far Cry 3 was great. Far Cry 4 was good. Far Cry 5 was okay. Far Cry Six is meh. Like, when, like when you when you when you when you do the same thing and you release it every year, year and a half. Like the reason Call of Duty works is that it's multiplayer. Yeah. There's that X factor of like competition and stuff like that. When you're releasing the same fucking open world game every year and a half, yeah. it doesn't work. Like, it, it, people burn out of it, especially with, like, Assassin's Creed Valhalla. Like, that game was bloated to, like, two, three hundred hours, 120, like, the storyline was, like, 20 hours. The rest of it was fucking map marker chasing and leveling up and getting gear to do side things that didn't matter. It's bloated for engagement metrics. Yeah. <laughs> as fast as they possibly Tips, can please. because they just want to try to make as much money as fast right. as they possibly can rather than paying attention to what the light. longevity of that game would look like how much more money you could make if the game lived longer but they just love killing games when you have an entire industry that is criticizing your games where in a lot of cases you can take some of these reviews for some of their games layer them on top of each other and it looks like they're reviewing the exact same game when you have your players that are complaining about your monetization practices and your prices you don't then go and just make all those things worse you don't just keep doing the exact same thing you don't inject you don't inject how do you put xp boost in a single player game what are you doing why? What is this? <laughs> it completely defeats the purpose of playing games like this in the first place. We know that all you're doing is just expanding the content as far as you possibly can to make it unrealistic for casual players to play without spending money. It's transparent. That's the worst part about them. They are transparent greed manifest. You can see everything they do and they think that they're being sneaky about it. What are you talking about? Get comfortable with uh, not buying your games. I know what you mean by that. I know the implications of what you're talking about. Because that means that you're going to try to make it where we can't buy games. That'll yeah. make us a little bit more comfortable with it in the future, right? Well, don't worry about it. We're all pretty comfortable with not buying your games. He says a line here that I really, really, really freaking like. Which brings us to the rapid decline of Ubisoft over the past few years, with release after release failing to deliver on expectations while doing nothing to compete with recent shifts in the market. To me, Tom Clancy's Ghost Recon Breakpoint in 2019 encapsulates everything that's wrong with modern Ubisoft. It was buggy, the writing was awful, it was repetitive and generic, overbloated and overmonetized. They monetized XP gains. They put vehicles and skins that had no business being in the game into the game and destroyed any sense of immersion in a largely single-player experience. Like every other open-world game from Ubisoft, even still today, they haphazardly put in RPG mechanics like varied loot, skill trees, and more. Mechanics that are only there to extend the player's time 
in the game. Putting these elements in there as a means to gatekeep players from progressing the story or taking on certain enemies. I think Skillup said it best when he was reviewing Breakpoint, saying, why the fuck is this in the game? Why is it so poorly implemented? And why is it in every game in their portfolio? This sort of design philosophy has proliferated through just about every single game that they make. And what makes matters worse for Ubisoft, and I think this is the one thing that the vast majority of people are overlooking here, is what's killing their sales. It's the increase in competition from other publishers with new successful IPs. Games like Elden Ring and Genshin Impact have captured player interest. Elden Ring's open world design and exploration set a new benchmark for the genre, while Genshin Impact offers a free-to-play model in an open world game with high production values and it's shaking up players' expectations. Games like these force players to compare similarities, and when you contrast Ubisoft games with the experiences that players have had access to over the past few years, it's no wonder why people aren't playing their games. And this goes back to what we were discussing previously. Ubisoft's core issue is their inability to change and recognize trends. Their loss in quality and generic monetization. Look at their first triple A, sorry, quadruple A game ever made. Here Skull comes your, a seventy dollar live game service one. in development. <laughs> okay. So do you know the history of this? I know very little about the history of this game, other than like I, I heard all the bullshit when there was this is gonna be like the first quadruple A game, and I was like, the fuck is that even? And Honestly, when I heard it tanked awfully, and that's about it. Okay, so let me set the stage. Okay. Assassin's Creed Black Flag. Yep. Did you ever play it? Um, I've got it on my games like thing, but I've not played it yet. Like it, it's it's on my list. I own the game, but I've just not gotten to it. But okay, I know it it's is... like one of the most beloved. It's probably my favorite Assassin's Creed. Okay. I I mean in that in that saying a lot because I really like Syndicate because I'm a sucker for the Victorian era, but it is probably my favorite Assassin's Creed, and in it obviously you play as Edward Kenway, okay, a pirate. One of the major points of the of the gameplay loop is being a pirate, okay. open ship combat, you know stuff like that. Yep. People are like I want to do this with my friends. Ubisoft was like, do you want to do that with your friends? And we were like, what did we just say? <laughs> All right. We hear you. We're going okay, to okay, okay. this. We're going to make this. Yahoo. Yep. Development. Yep. Two years. Okay. Three years. <laughs> Four years. <laughs> Five years. What, what happened? Skull and Bones. We're working on it. Oh, okay. Yeah, we took money from the Singaporean government to finance it. Oh, okay. Cool. How's it going? Working on it. Six years. Seven <laughs> years. Eight years. Holy Nine. shit. This thing was in development hell since like a year after Black Flag. So let me look up when oh my God. Black Flag released. I know that people are still asking for like a Black Flag like remake. Yeah, yeah. Black Flag released in 2013. So yeah, 2014, <laughs> it was 10 years in development until it Jesus. was from development to release. And you have to think, too, like in 2013, they started pre, pre-production. pre So this is a full development time in 2014. Not like sketching, doing all that. That was done in 2013. Holy 2014 shit. 2014 is when they started the actual development work. And they were like, okay, we hear you. Hey, what's that over... What's Microsoft doing? What, no, no, please. We want multiplayer Black Flag. What? <laughs> what, what? <laughs> oh, they do pirate game. They do pirate game. What would that look like? No, we don't want Sea of Thieves. Yeah. What? <laughs> pirate game over there. They, they sell microtransactions. No, we don't, we don't want Sea of Thieves. Oh, we we make we make big sea of thieves. No, please, <laughs> Ubisoft, come back, back to come back, please. <laughs> All right, and by that time the boat's already sailed. All right, and so oh, they've I, I completely the shifted. Okay. <laughs> yeah, they completely shifted it into being like Sea of Thieves, but they forgot the one thing is when you copy another game. <laughs> You're competing with that game. Yeah. Instead of being multiplayer Black Flag, which would have been unique, they're trying to be quadruple A. Sea of Thieves. Over. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. When I would play that, or I could play Sea of Thieves, which has six years of content built into it. Yeah, in the same period of time. 
That's funny. Yeah, or or, or your your game, which releases with hardly anything. Oh man! I mean, like there are ships in that game. Like they've designed it like almost like an MMO. Like there's ships that are like this is a healing ship. You have cannons that can fire. Oh my god! Healing things out of it. Which doesn't make any sense, because, like, I can't shoot... Like, if we're on the high seas, I can't shoot wood at you and fix a hole. <laughs> but for gameplay, I guess it works. But then they completely threw that out. So then you have some of these ships that heal, but it doesn't matter, because the game design has shifted. But they didn't shift that out of the game design. <laughs> so you have pieces of, like, these broken sort of, like... So it's... This it's... Is exactly nothing yeah yeah because it's like you have these pieces of like oh well this is what that system would have been like that was developed six years ago but they put so much dev time and money into it they just left it in because they didn't want to waste that it doesn't fit with this but we're gonna leave that in and then this piece and that piece oh it's like God. imagine like you're trying to build a human but then you just throw random things onto it. So, like, <laughs> one arm is, like, bigger than the other. And, like, you have two left legs. Like, that's what that's what it came out of. They stitched different pieces. It's, like, the New World version of boats. Oh. Like, that's the same thing that happened with Amazon's New World. Is they shifted design so much in development, but they kept parts of the old design that doesn't mesh with the new design to the point where it's like a Franken game. Yeah. Like, and it it doesn't make any sense. And they spent tons of money on it because they had to keep restarting development on it again and again and again to the point where the Singaporean government is like, do we have to sue you? Oh and that's gosh. why it was released. And they basically it wasn't kinda... released because it was done. It was released because it was that or a lawsuit. They had a metaphorical they... gun to their head. Okay, okay. No, they probably had a real <laughs> legal gun to their head. Like they were like legitimately starting arbitration, and oh they were like, "No, we God. we did it. We did it. It's out. It's out." Oh <laughs> like, my yeah, God. After that sounds nine like, and yeah. a half, ten years. It sounds yeah, like okay, the kind sure. of game I want to buy. Yeah, and then they're like, oh, well, we don't know why it's not selling well. For one, you put it on your bullshit dog water storefront. <laughs> not on Ubi Play, not on Steam, not on Game Pass, not on Epic Game Store. Ubi Play. Yeah. Which half the time you can't connect to because the servers scream like, the alarm guys from the first segment <laughs> if more than three people try to connect to the server at once. Oh my god. <laughs> like, it's fucking a travesty. Like, it's... Oh god. And like, Ghost Recon, they were talking about um, Breakpoint. It sucked. It took them three years, I think, until they added a mode called Give Me Ghost Recon. It's called <laughs> Give Me Ghost Recon. Right? And it strips all of the RPG elements out. And it makes it it makes it like a open world Ghost Recon game. Like oh my we've been god. fucking asking you for. So they actually but had to took... mod the game to be the game that they wanted it to be? Yes! Oh my god. Yes! Because you know what? Trying to hunt down a G36 with plus four damage on it isn't fun. <laughs> it's not. I want to get the gun and get my damn attachments, and then maybe I want to shoot some dude in the head. Yeah. I don't want to have to keep running around and looking for the the the, the number go up fun. Yeah. If I wanted to do that, I'd play Path of Exile. They're better at it than you. Oh my god. <laughs> oh. Triple A, sorry, quadruple A game ever made, Skull and Bones, a $70 live service title in development for 11 years, costing over $200 million, only to release a more boring version of Assassin's Creed Black Flag with less than 700 concurrent players on Steam. They set out to make a more consumable version of Assassin's Creed with Mirage, charging $50 for a less yeah, than 15 hour Steam, game like, that did nothing after. Oh, yeah. <laughs> When they realized that they fucked up and they didn't get anyone in. And they were desperately like maybe trying we'll, to get sales yeah, somewhere kind of thing. Maybe we'll put it on Steam and put it for 20% off. And then they Ooh. could only scrape. They'd still scraped more than Concord, though. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, I guess. If you beat Sony, yeah. I, 
congrats, you're not as bad as Sony. <laughs> but, like, it took them even time for it to put it on Steam, like, to, for them to be like, well, fuck. Like, and the fact that they're to still something. hesitant to, re- to, like, do that even after all this stuff, like, like they saw some success there. You would think that, like, that would be something to maybe chase. And, like, uh, from what I remember with this video, like, they, they're hesitant even still to this day with anything Steam-wise. Yeah, only now are they doing it because they they've completely they're bringing um Star Wars Outlaws to Steam in November and they're launching Shadows on Steam day 1. Yeah, well. <laughs> and it only took them to have record breaking pre-orders and record breaking as in nobody wants it record breaking <laughs> not, not the like good record breaking. <laughs> yeah, not the one that's like, "Whoa, we just made like 159 million percent of our budget and we're we're literally raking in cash like no and we like haven't not even gotten anything out yet yeah yeah not even the guy that worked on the fucking game pre-ordered it oh my god <laughs> okay <laughs> like not even not even your employees give a shit enough about it to buy it oh. okay that's how bad it's performing Nothing to evolve the franchise. They finally returned to Prince of Persia with a lost crown. They made an awesome game. It was really innovative. I actually enjoyed it, but they charged $40 for a Metroidvania game in a market where those games cost a fourth of the price. Star Wars Outlaws, a game for all intents and purposes, should have been an easy home run, but ultimately showcases how dire the situation is at Ubisoft. Not only does the game suffer from quality issues, unattractive character designs, bugs, repetitiveness, and inconsistencies, but in an attempt to remove some of their open world bloat, you come to realize just how those elements, once they're removed, the game is really just held together by duct tape. Eurogamer in their review said something really interesting, saying that the problem with Star Wars Outlaws, however, isn't that it adheres too closely to the development approach akin to hoarding, but that it does the opposite, stripping away years of accumulated video game clutter. Admirably, Outlaws does this quite aggressively, Kessel Sabak aside. But in doing so, it reveals an integral issue. Ubisoft open world games are not only fun because of their formula, they are their formula. To strip away isn't to peel off some old wallpaper to reveal the original brickwork, it's lifting up the carpet to find a whacking great hole in the ground. Meaning that their games are hollow, and I think that that's a fitting description. From my perspective as a player, Ubisoft has become synonymous with generic games that are overpriced, overmonetized, and overly repetitive. Outside of the Division 1 and 2, I've had no interest whatsoever in playing any of their games because I've already played them years ago, and playing the next game isn't going to be any different. It's the same games pushed out the door for profit that lack any creativity or originality. Now we look at their next release, Assassin's Creed Shadows, a game criticized well before its release. And, like, I know this is something we've covered quite extensively, so, like, at least now it's coming full circle and I've got a little more, I could put some more in. Because, other than Legacy Media, everyone else can see the elephant in the room, an Assassin's Creed game finally set in Japan, a setting that is so great for a game with this kind of theme, only to include a tokenized representation of a character with vague at best historical relevance backed by a hip-hop soundtrack in combat. Why is it that representation to these people means hip-hop soundtracks or a character wearing Jordans whose power is that they run fast? I'll be honest, I think that a lot of the dialogue surrounding Assassin's Creed Shadows are issues that players would largely ignore if they knew that Assassin's Creed, that this game, was going to be incredible. But over the years, players have come to expect less and less from Ubisoft games. Why are investors so concerned? Why are they jumping ship before one of the largest releases of Ubisoft in recent memory? Well, why don't you tell me why anyone would want to play Assassin's Creed Shadows when they have far better Eastern-themed alternatives that without a doubt have better combat, better environments, higher quality, and better storytelling, without the need to be able to make a statement or press their morals against an audience? Why would I play Assassin's Creed Shadows when I could play Black Myth Wukong, Ghost of Tsushima, or Rise of Ronin? Why would I play something that I've already played when I could play something entirely free? Yeah, I've noticed that too. Okay, so like, again, you know, casual gamer here. I haven't even been up on like the new releases and everything else. But like, it seems like this is a super active market right now, right? Like, and to bring out a game that's been as controversial as this game has been seems very risky. It's not like you're going into an emerging area. It's like... how do I want to word this? It's um, it's kind of a newer genre, like a re- maybe revitalized genre is probably the better way to say it. And like, there's a lot of stuff going on. Let's just put it that way for light light purposes, because my brain's fired. But um, like yeah, the, the, there's God the titles that he just mentioned. I don't even know them, but I, like I've heard of them. So like it's like there's a lot of new titles coming out in this with this same and similar. Um, stylization, let's put it that way. Yeah, and I think the biggest issue too here is the story, right? Yes. Like, Black Myth Wukong is a Chinese-developed game based on the journey to the West, okay. right? So it takes their mythology, respects it, tells the story of Sun Wukong okay. in the mythology of China. You know, that's that's one of those things. Like it's it's a very good tale. 
and it's like it's sharing a vibrancy and a love of their culture and then you have shadows <laughs> that literally which, is doing the exact opposite which has the face. <laughs> yasuke which is a black samurai which wasn't and then apparently they're also making him gay which he wasn't well and then i think this touches on the other thing that's going on but um yeah and then the the promotional material i know i talked to you about this they had a a single pillar tory gate yes and if you don't know in chat that is a an incredibly potent part of japanese history because it's very what impactful, it represents, very meaningful part yes it represents um back during world war ii with nagasaki when we dropped the atomic bomb 800 i think it was 800 uh kilometers away from the impact was a place called the sano shrine it had two tori gates the sheer force of the impact knocked over one of the gates, but the other gate stood. And it was said that that was supposed to be the resilience and the willpower of the Japanese people to continue on. It became like this sort of like national pride thing for the Japanese that like, you know, we still stood in the face of that adversity and atrocity. And then this company from France takes that symbol and throws their black samurai game in it. Yes. And it completely spits in their face. It would be hey, like if we were to do like a um, it's in uh, another uh, game and the main character is um, Jewish and we <laughs> threw them in front of a gas chamber from Auschwitz. <laughs> and it's like you just are you just have a checklist of how offensive to that culture you could be yes like you know what i mean like you have a you know what i mean it, it, it just it feels so disingenuous it's like in the in the in the game you can see there's buildings and you look at that and it's chinese architecture yasuke's sword is a sword from an anime one piece they didn't respect anything about the culture and now they're wondering why nobody wants it when like you have black myth wukong that's you know uh like actually doing everything that it should yeah. you have ghost of tsushima which literally the island of tsushima honored sucker punch with an award uh, they literally made a cultural award and gave it to sucker punch as a thank you for respecting the Japanese culture that heavily. And then you have Ubisoft, which is slapping them in the face and then telling them, no, Japanese man, your culture is wrong. Yeah. What the fuck do you know about it, Westerner? What fuck you, Gaijin? <laughs> Where, who are you? <laughs> who the fuck are you? You sit in your stuffy French apartment smelling like cheese. Fuck you. Like, Fresh. yeah. Ubisoft's issues are the same issues that plague the vast majority of the largest publishers and developers in the industry, and it's that over the years, while they've continued to grow and chase profits, they've lost a unified vision of what their game should represent. In the pursuit for profits and expanding their market share and maximizing revenue through aggressive monetization strategies, they've strayed from the creative foundations that once made them an industry leader. This fragmented approach has led to a loss of identity, resulting in games that feel more like products that are turned out to meet quarterly targets rather than passionate, well-crafted experiences. Look at the speed of Ubisoft's game releases. They struck the iron while the iron was hot, barely spacing any of their game releases, rarely making new IPs, or changing their perspective on how to deliver existing franchises. This lack of cohesive vision and the inability to change has not only diluted the quality and the uniqueness of their franchises, but also eroded the trust and enthusiasm of the player bases. They're exhausted. Without a clear sense of purpose and a commitment to innovation and quality, Ubisoft, like many others in the industry, has found itself trapped in a cycle of diminishing returns and waning relevance. And I'll be honest, it's not going to stop. From my perspective, this is likely the end of Ubisoft. The ship is too big to be able to turn on a dime, and the kind of overhaul that they need is likely a decade away. We can't save Ubisoft, and honestly, we don't want to. I'm kind of, it is kind of actually like in hindsight with the other video. And I will say that this video is really on point to call this. I think they called it like what? Uh, the 18th. So yeah, 10 days ago, 11 yeah. days ago. Let this be a stark warning to the rest of the industry, a cautionary tale. When you turn out games that nobody wants to buy, when you nickel and dime your players at every turn, when you strip your games of their soul, you don't just lose a sale. You lose your place in the industry.
play stupid games, win stupid prizes, and Ubisoft has played them all. I tried to do my best to be able to showcase the highs and lows of the company and all the games that they made, but I found the more that I researched, the more that I wrote, I just kept talking about the same games over and over again for damn near 20 years. Assassin's Creed, Rainbow Six, Far Cry. Assassin's Creed, Rainbow Six, Far Cry. Assassin's Creed, Rainbow Six, Far Cry. And well, you want to make sure that you're doing what you can to support the titles that players love the most, the reason why they know your name to begin with. At the same time, when you're absurdly aggressive like Ubisoft, where you just keep pumping out the same titles over and over again, and at the exact same time, you just continue to crank up the monetization and the pricing and how many things are locked behind different versions of your game for $100, $130. Good Lord, what do you expect? What do you think is going to happen when you keep making the same thing over and over I'm sorry, as a casual gamer, like, you've got to make a pretty fucking impressive game for me to drop $120 fucking dollars on it. Right? Like, and I've done that before, right? Like, I've dropped 120 but it's, like, usually on, like, really, really, like, important games. Like, I'll buy collector's editions for, like, like Final Fantasy expansions, or, like... Okay. You know, like, like things that, like, are actually meaningful to me. Like, yeah. if Project Moon, if they were to release their next game as, like, a $100 collector's, I would probably buy anything from Project Moon. And see, and like, I, with I, me, it's it's got to offer enough content for me to, like, feel like I'm getting that out of it. Like, yeah. you, I, I better be getting every fucking DLC from now for the next 10 years. You better be guaranteeing me basically 10 years of support. <laughs> and, like, right. like, I mean, other than that, you better be offering me, like, three to four hundred hours of, like, game pay, gameplay. Yeah, and it better not be, like, some of these other fucking games where it's broken on launch. Like, I yes. want a functional yeah. product. Oh, no, it's got to be 100% on point. You know, and that's and that's one of those things, too, that's, like, an issue with the industry. Well, I've been playing a lot more indie games lately. Yeah, well, just... they, have a, they have a stake to come out and market, otherwise, or hit their mark, otherwise they're, like... They're they're more liable to go under where these other bigger game studios it feels like they can put out a kind of bland like mid game and then like patch it into maybe playable. Yeah, yeah, and and, and it's if been not, they're gonna come out with another game next year, so it it'll make up for it. In their yeah, well, process. it works for a bit, but that's what happened to Ubisoft. Yeah, so like it it you you can only get away with it for so long, you know. It's the issue though is with these big publishers like this is like we need indie game studios. Like I've been uh playing Lo- Lobotomy Corporation again and I fucking forgot how much I love Project Moon games. Like <laughs> like have you ever played Fallout Shelter? Yes, a little bit, yeah. So it's basically that. Okay. But imagine that instead of that it's a science facility that you're trying to get power, and your power is made from SCPs. Oh, okay. That's an easy. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so you like you're, you're literally managing this corporation, and like you're trying to do like research, and you're doing like these dangerous anomalies, and you're trying to manage your team, and then it's like, oh yeah, no, the doomsday clock anomaly is like. Oh, it's ticking, and oh, everyone died. Oh, okay, yeah. um, this person, this anomaly made. Oh no, nope, they're killing everyone. Yeah. Okay, like you know, fire, <laughs> like, but they have like these, this deep like story to it that's like based on like the the Jewish tree of life, and then like you have the sequel, Library of Ruin, a completely different genre, and then you have the Limbus Company, their gotcha game. Which is tied as a sequel to both of them. Okay. Like, so it's like you have these, like, really cool, interesting, like, little indie games that both do something different and really unique. And then you have Ubi Schlock. That's, like, $70. <laughs> or you Just can get, like... content that's copy-pasted and prettied up, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, and I would spend $70 in Limbus Company for, like, 30 pulls in a gotcha game over $70 for Assassin's Creed Shadows because I know that they said like, yeah, we're making this gotcha game and we're doing this to fund our next games. Yeah. So that way we don't need a publisher. Yep. Like, so I'm like, as a fan of your studio, then I have no problem funding your. Yeah. And at least they're forthright with it and everything else. And it's up front. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and they're saying that we're running the gotcha team at basically a, a neutral because yeah. all the profit from the gotcha is going into 
making more content for the gacha, and then what's not is going towards our actual main games, which will tie into Limbus Company, like, we're making a universe. That's cool. And guess where that, that studio is out of? South Korea. <laughs> all of the, all of Asia, just like Black Myth Wukong, oh, coming out of China, Once Human coming out of China, um, other games coming out of, like, Elden Ring coming out of Japan. The the Western design philosophy has crumbled to like this monetization. Yeah, it really has. Oh man! All right, let's try and power through this as yeah. as much as we can. Yeah. On and I don't know if you know, but Ubisoft is kind of going through a hard time right now. From delaying Assassin's Creed Shadows to Star Wars Outlaws underperforming, and their CEO actually saying that the company has never chased agendas. We so they're delaying Shadows. Yes, you know. And it's funny that you say that. They're de delaying it until February 14th, right around when the most anticipated Monster Hunter is coming out. When it's releasing now, actually, is a better window because there's nothing to compete with. You're competing with, like, the 20th anniversary Monster Hunter game. Yeah, I think they're, this guy makes some pretty solid points on why they're doing that. And on top of that, uh, the fact that there's other changes happening which is funny so thanks for that i needed a good laugh beyond this i'll talk about how ubisoft gave birth to sweet baby inc and how this is all coming to a roaring meltdown unlike any other the simple question is simply this is ubisoft falling apart the biggest loss for woke identity politically driven content in gaming and the answer to that dear viewer is a resounding yes this is like the kingdom of a warring country falling apart amidst a pivotal war and their king is shaking in his boots his servants are robbing him blind and his own soldiers are refusing to defend him my dear viewers this is the complete and utter collapse of ubisoft as an entertainment brand and they did it all to themselves let's first look at paul tassi who you may know is a journalist that tends to pander to whatever these corporations want he had an article recently titled after assassin's creed shadows delay ubisoft acknowledges outlaws issues anti-woke pushback paul tassi spends the majority of the article stating that ubisoft is basically screwed and that he is genuinely surprised that the ubisoft higher-ups are starting to cave into what he calls anti-woke pushback or as i like to call it for what it really is common sense What's crazy is that at one point, Paul Tassi <laughs> says in his article that he has seen talk about the three-month delay and that it is being used to actually remove Yasuke or lessen his presence in the game entirely. But at this They're actually removing him. That's... See, and I don't want him removed. I just don't want him to be playable. Put him like Leonardo da Vinci and stuff. Like, a support character. That's... Make him what he was in history. That's kind of what they're doing, but it's going to be interesting. Like, there's this is a really interesting perspective. At this point, I don't know if it's going to do much of anything. Can you really remove the guy? I mean, he's on the front cover, he's in all of the promos, he's in the CGI trailers, gameplay debuts. His identity right now is deliberately tied to this game in every way. Would I think it would be better without Yasuke? Absolutely. But do I think they'll do it regardless? I don't know. However, it would be amazingly funny to see this game get reannounced with no Yasuke anymore. I would actually laugh so hard, I would probably die. There would be no greater comedic moment than for this to happen, because the journalist would then go rabid and then Sales of Shadows would shoot through the roof in response. If Ubisoft is smart, they'll remove Yasuke and then they'll turn him into a Japanese guy and then fix everything surrounding it. But will they? I mean, I guess we'll see, but could they be? Well, there's a lot more to this that this guy doesn't pick up on. And uh, the other guy I pointed out is that like, okay, so if you remove the black character that all is at the like root of this controversy and everything else, right? Well, then guess what else? The He points out like the voice doesn't line up. So now you're going to have to redo the voicing possibly. I think you can yeah. still probably get away with it. But here's the other thing. The music is not going to fit. Oh my god. The, the, you mean the slightly potentially racist Afro-Asian Afro fusion music that was offensive and didn't serve a purpose? It's now to going be to be oh, no. completely pointless. Oh no, please don't remove that. <laughs> be crazy enough and to put do it, traditional man, Japanese just... music? Yeah, I, I, you know. Honestly, they probably could get people easily to flock and help them if they would have admitted this months ago. For a moment here, that they do end up doing this, okay? If Yasuke were to be removed from Shadows completely, could three months be a reasonable amount of time to actually complete this massive undertaking? Like I said, the guy is on the cover, he's in the trailers, but to be real with you, it wouldn't be impossible to do. Don't get me wrong, it would be an insane amount of work, I'm not debating that. They would have to effectively change every single conversation where the name Yasuke is ever uttered, and of course change it to some original character's name instead. But beyond this, I would wager that the game likely has full-blown expensive cutscenes where Yasuke is shown fighting for his lord. They could of course just go in and change him to a Japanese man, but what would this end up doing in the long run on one hand if this were to happen because then you got to cut and re-render all those scenes 
on top of now you're yeah. editing all the text and then so you're going to probably edit the dialogue so and then again there's still the point of like the music ain't gonna fit because yeah. then it's gonna be like this this afro asian clash with for no real reason an afro tie <laughs> I've been as I play devil's advocate here, it would understandably come across as a very positive thing for many who are against shadows right now. I believe the majority of people generally don't want shadows not because of Nowe existing, but because of Yasuke. Because of course he's the first actual historical figure that we're playing as in an Assassin's Creed game for seemingly the entirety of it. The only other time I can think of is King Leonidas in the beginning of Odyssey, which was more of a tutorial until you actually chose your character in that game. And yeah. I think that we can all agree that Yasuke being in the game is a big reason why that the Japanese are against the game because it's a random foreigner that's attacking their own people in their homeland while wearing their cultural armor and using their weapons and techniques to do so. As one user on Twitter put it, and oh boy, this is spicy, they said about the delay of shadows, just delay it forever, no one wants to play as a black dude killing Asians in feudal Japan, we see that enough in San Francisco. Oh, that is one <laughs> What do you think of that? Like I said, this Based. is a brutal, this is brutal video. Like, Based. there was no <laughs> fucking holding back in this video. This, this guy you went way more unhinged. Holy f well, Endymion always does do like more culture war where legendary drops is like more like in my sphere of like game critique. Yeah. But like, I just, if I want to play the black dude killing Asians, I would just go to San Francisco. <laughs> spicy Holy comment on this, but hey, so that's great. freedom of speech working as intended, fellas. I would wager if anything gets fixed about shadows, it will hopefully be things like the one-legged Tory gate that was being used in a merchandise item that takes place hundreds of years before said nuclear bomb caused that Tory gate to happen. As well yeah. And also, like, rubbing in, you know, a nearly genocidal fucking thing that happened to their culture. So the whole Tory gate thing, so the, this is obviously the Tory gate, right? And then the whole yeah. thing is just the fact that, like, in the in the wake of a nuclear bomb, the whole thing wasn't destroyed. Part of it remained. Yeah. That's that thing I went on that tangent like yeah. twenty minutes ago. You're fine. Do you remember chat if you're still awake? <laughs> like <laughs> at five thirty in the morning. Please like the stream. <laughs> As well as the myriad of mistakes like having portraits on walls in game that didn't even exist until after the time period the game is set in. And of course, much, much more. I figure this will be what they will likely be fixing, but I do think if they did fix Yasuke, we would actually have a mega hit on our hands, and no, I'm not kidding either. Removing Yasuke and then taking the time to properly adhere to and respect the authenticity of Japanese culture would actually go a long way in restoring faith in the franchise. I think releasing it the way it is now... So th that's the... that's the voice uh, the fact that they think that this guy is being removed is coming from this article right this guy's gonna yeah. now like point out why he doesn't think this is gonna happen well he will do nothing but tank assassin's creed and just kill ubisoft and as you continue to watch the video after this segment you'll see what i mean by ubisoft just dying like crazy but if what paul tassi is saying is true and again i don't know if it is so take it as a rumor but if it is shadows might actually be worth buying sure it's annoying we would have two playable characters again like in syndicate but if they're both japanese and the new yasuke is just a giant japanese dude i'm actually okay with this just let the people of that nation have their own game i don't want a white guy playable in a future assassin's creed game that is set in china and the vice versa if ubisoft does this they will win big but will they i guess time will tell now let's move on to another story where, as Park Place Details financial analyst describes Ubisoft sales collapse and delaying of Assassin's Creed Shadows as total meltdown as stock price collapses. The analyst in question is actually Valiant Renegade, who's a friend of the channel and also recently released a video about Ubisoft stock prices hitting a new record low. He also interviewed me for the video as well, so I appear at certain points with a disheveled head of hair as I was just about to go to the gym when Valiant asked me for my opinion on things. But my messy hair aside, Valiant brings up some crazy points, so here, please watch this clip. A little over four years ago, Ubisoft was trading at nearly 90. So this is going to get more into some of the stuff that like we already saw where it's talking about like they've lost 90% of their value. To use Assassin's Creed Shadows as a tourniquet to essentially block the bleeding from being too bad for them in the next financial quarter. Ubisoft has delayed Shadows to February, which is funny if you think about it. Because the game stars Yasuke, a so-called black samurai that totally existed, just trust me bro. And the game is coming out now during Black History Month, which is clever. Did you think about that? Oh, that's scummy as fuck. So odds are that they're it's probably a... not going to remove him. It's a good thing that you're launching right alongside Monster Hunter so I can go kill some great Jaggy and think about how much fun I'm having not playing you. Yeah, so they're going <laughs> to lean they're going to lean into the person of color thing here. Nice, nice cuz that's, you know, that's exactly what we need. You know, we play great 
in Greece, we play as a Greek. In Italy, we play as an Italian. Yeah. France, we play as the French, and in Japan, Japan we play as black. black. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Yeah, because that's that's you know totally respectful to their culture. Like, However, Ubisoft, I see what you're doing there. You're gonna try to prop up Yasuke during a heightened sense of social status of virtue signaling in order to guilt trip people into supporting the game because it has a black guy in it. Obviously, most people won't fall for this, but they're hoping they can gaslight enough of you into maybe buying it. I suggest not doing that. As Grums has quoted many times, it'll take around two years of closing your wallets until the entire game industry will have to kneel to your demands. You're already almost at the end of year one, and I wager that most of your backlogs are probably still insane like mine is. So you don't really need most new games these days anyways? Man, I still haven't even played Like a Dragon Infinite Wealth yet. I'm still too busy trying to platinum Visions of Mana. And I want to play Space Ring 2 more as well, and my friends keep inviting me to shoot people in Fortnite between all of this, so yeah, I'm good. I don't need Shadows, especially not at release. The game is delayed for three months now, which is past its original release date of November 15th, but let's be real, it still won't save them. I don't know what Ubisoft... Well, and the other thing too is that, like, it, there's a real risk to that, like, so you're delaying for, in, in, in the grand scheme of things, with this whole fucking game, relatively minor drama, seeing that you've totally, like, staked everything on this character that the Japanese government has already very strongly voiced to disagree with, in order to fix... A, this totem which probably could be fixed before yeah, release it, it's one of those things where it's like it doesn't need a three month delay that's yes. that's some there's something fishy about that like it's either for black history month or that they are doing like massive revamps of the game yeah because it, there, there's like both no could way apply that they're here. doing it for just a Tory gate yeah. either that or the third option is it's in such a piss poor technical state they need that extra time just to make it run for optimization they're like we cannot get this optimized like we thought we could which so either way it's not a good sign across the board yeah like, and and mind you that also puts it outside of holiday time which is like one of the biggest times of the year and i know nothing about gaming but i know that's like one of the biggest times of the year for releases into mm -hmm. like early spring which is like known for nothing well like i said like um it's february let me double check and see what's coming out in february because like i said i do know monster hunter is um 2025 game releases because i actually think there's this spring is actually gonna kill it oh yeah yeah so here's what's coming out okay in february kingdom come deliverance 2 february 11th <laughs> civilization 7 february 11th avowed February 18th, Monster Hunter Wild, February 27th, and Like a Dragon, Pirate Yakuza in Hawaii, February 27th. That is the most stacked fucking February I've ever seen. And it's releasing right between all of that, like dead smack in yes. the middle, because it's yes. February 14th. They're doing a Valentine's yes. Day. Yeah, everybody wants avowed. Everybody that likes RPGs wants avowed. Everybody's been waiting for that. It's this. It's the Skyrim styled sequel made by Obsidian for um, uh, Pillars of Eternity, the, that franchise. Civ Seven, obviously, everybody knows Civilization. That's yep. so good. Kingdom Come Deliverance. It's basically what Assassin's Creed is, but Oof. actually <laughs> legit. Okay. All like right, it, right, it's right, literally right. set in um the holy roman empire okay and you play as a guy that like his family is killed or whatever and you literally learn how to fight and like it's to the point where like skills like you can't read so oh, like we'll okay. pick up like actual books and it will look like gibberish until you start learning to read and then it, like it's like you actually start seeing words so oh, it's shit. like okay yeah it's like extremely detailed there and then you have Monster Hunter Wilds, like I said, it, biggest, most anticipated Monster Hunter yet. And then like a dragon, like everybody loves like Japanese GTA. Yeah. So it's like what? Oh man, you, you, this be they, they shot off. themselves in the head with this. Yeah, you're you're better off releasing now and just saying I'm sorry, we'll patch it, and just releasing it for like forty bucks now, or and just patching it later, making it a budget title. Yeah. Or or just removing it completely, honestly. Yeah, canceling it and writing, getting a tax write off. Yep. And maybe starting fresh. Yep. Things like, they can do in that time to fix this game that'll appease the players at all. 
The combat is already set in stone. Your cinematics are done. You likely have plenty of post DLC outfits already fixed and ready to go. So realistically, there's not much they can do. All they're hoping for at this point is to use Black History Month into goading you into buying it. I mean, Suicide Squad also took a year of extra dev time, and that didn't really save them either. It's still reviewed horribly, it's sold even worse, and now they got a new season where you can play as Deadshot's daughter Lawless. Please be excited, everyone. You better clap, or I'm gonna call HR and get you fired for being racist. I guess it'll be a big day come October for the 200 people that are still playing Suicide Squad, but hey, this is what happens when you don't give people what they want. Ubisoft is likely going to just close shop and liquidate their assets. I really don't see any way out for them when it comes to this. Because beyond Shadows, they have nothing that could reasonably save them in the future. Their trump cards, so to speak, were Outlaws and Shadows, and we know that Outlaws did not sell well at all. I mean, Ubisoft even admitted recently that Outlaws didn't sell within expectations, and has actually reduced their profit margins by around 30%. Which is, obviously, not good at all. But hey, nobody told you to put a man solo in the game as the lead, you did that yourselves. Actually, another YouTuber named Legendary Drops spoke to anonymous Ubisoft employees recently in his video. He detailed that these employees told him that Ubisoft did this to themselves, and that virtue signaling was a key reason why they're passing the point of no return financially. At one point in the video, an employee told him the editorial direction and overall mindset shifted from boys club to safe content. Reaching for plain characters like KVS in Star Wars is the perfect example of this. The idea to have beautiful characters, such as in Baldur's Gate or Uncharted, is met with distrust. So as you heard, Ubisoft went from catering to male players, or a boys club, I guess, and then they went full pandering, and now they're close to liquidating everything. And so they're, they're just straight up, like, owning it. They're, they're literally owning their death almost at this point. They're, like, yeah, finally they, they fessing up cause. to everything. They did it for the cause. And they're, like, they're hoping... I feel like they're hanging their hats on the hopes that, like, these people will seek sympathy and save them somehow. And traditionally, it's shown to never be the case. Yeah, the only other move other than, like, in, what Endymion said about just mass liquidation is just downsize. Just severely downsize. Downsize enough. You, well, you, you have to literally get rid of, like, probably three quarters of the staff at the least. I would I would say do that. Do that and refocus on Siege. And just focus on the one game you have that's making money. Just be one of those really tight, sort of lean studios that focus on one project. And just sort of cut and, r cut and run out of the AAA space. And just be a, like like Bungie was. Where they, when they just did Destiny, just be like one of those studios that like just makes one product. Yeah. Oh, man. I think we're almost done with this because the rest of it kind of goes into the other stuff. This safe content, as it's put, is a big reason why so much stuff sucks today. Everything is getting sanded off so that the edges are removed. There's nothing to offend you or really challenge your perspective. A lot of Western modern gaming is pretty much like that one image of SpongeBob with all of his edges gone. That's what it is, actually. Because nobody wants to play Star Wars Outlaws. The game bombed, but Ubisoft is confident that the game will sell come the fall season. But as I made the analogy in Valiant Renegade's video, Ubisoft games are like buying a car from a dealership. The moment the game is sold and it leaves the lot, so to speak, Ubisoft's games just lose a ton of their projected value right out of the gate. By this fall, Outlaws will easily be half off, if even more than that. Maybe it'll sell more by then, but it'll be at a fraction of what it could have earned during release, but hey, that's what happens. Ubisoft said, if you remember, that we should be comfortable not owning our games in the future, so I guess Ubisoft should get comfortable no longer existing and kicking rocks instead. And the fact- <laughs> That was the line I was looking for earlier, but- I agree. <laughs> Alright, I'm gonna cut it at the end, we'll leave the rest of us if people really, 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 I can't even speak anymore. Really wanna watch it. Um.